Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we spend time in the Word. We started last week looking at, uh, well, you know, actually we had gone from that uh, attitude of the righteous and call to ministry, looking at the seven P's <laughs> that were found by in the letter to Philippians by Paul, which was purpose, praise, price, power, perspective, perseverance. And this week we made that transition to prayer, the last of those. Mm -hmm. Not that it is least important. No. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. So we started last week a study on prayer. Um, conversations with my father. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what prayer is. So we're going to pick up on where we left off last week. But before we do, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, you said you would be with us when any two or three people come together. So, Lord, you are here and just bless your word into our minds and hearts. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes, Father, we are gathered in your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of your son, Christ Jesus, the word made flesh who dwelt among us. All right, last week we finished, I was talking about the three, <laughs> and you have to give me some leeway here, three basic types of prayer. Mm -hmm. There's individual prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Went to your prayer closet, and, and then there's corporate prayer coming together, two or three agree. Mm -hmm. And then the other one I wanted to talk about was bad prayer. <laughs> Can there be such a thing as bad prayer? Sure. Sure. You know the account, I think it's in uh, Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 4, where Jesus and the disciples were going across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm arose, um, a fierce storm, mm -hmm. um, a very fierce storm. And remember, there are professional fishermen on board this boat. Mm -hmm. And as the storm gets so terrible, they go to Jesus, who is asleep in the boat, and wake him and say, don't you care that we're perishing? They were in a panic. Well, they, they and it must have been a bad storm yeah. because they know the, the, the sea, right? And I said, well, that's, that's prayer. First of all, conversation with Jesus is prayer, mm -hmm. right? But it's a bad prayer. And the reason I know it's a bad prayer is because what he did was he did. He got up and he calmed the storm and the waves and they were astounded that even the wind and the waves obeyed him. But he said to them, oh, you of little faith, because their prayer was a confession of their lack of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark and I were talking about this the other day in, in the car. He said, well, what should you do? And I said, well, you know, it says in Ephesians 5 that we're to imitate Jesus. They should have laid down and had a good sleep. <laughs> <laughs> laid down next to him, right? No, what they should have done was what Jesus was yes. doing, resting. Yes. No matter what the circumstance, we can rest in the Lord. No matter how fierce the storm, we can rest in Jesus. All right? Be careful that your prayer doesn't confess a lack of faith. You know, I, I, as many times as I have taught that and preached it, uh, I have also practiced it in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. I remember a number of years ago, uh, we were living in a, we were renting a condominium from a dear brother of ours who lived about, 1,300 miles away from us. And it was at that time when there was the uh, housing collapse here in the United States and other places. And we live, Alice and I, you know, we live by faith and it's always depending on the Lord to supply our needs and the rent was a need. Mm -hmm. But this particular month, I didn't have the funds and I was so concerned, not for Alice, not for myself, but for our dear brother because he had invested in this and that, that market, that real estate market was collapsing around us. And I, so I was praying, but I was praying more for him. And I kept saying, Lord, what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to him if I can't pay the rent? What's going to happen? And I kept going on and on and on and on like a silly little child until I heard that still small voice. And it said to me, he said to me, why are you planning on me to fail? And that was like a slap in the face because I realized that my prayer, my conversation with him was exactly that. Mm -hmm. 
It was a confession of my lack of faith. I mean, I was planning on him to, to fail. He said that he would meet all of our needs. Right. He would supply all of our needs. What was I worried about? Well, it, it seemed easier because I, I, I could tell myself I was worried about the, 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 the brother more than I was about myself. It doesn't matter. Mm. It was still a lack of faith. And I will tell you that uh, I went that day and I, I repented publicly. And that day I, I had an astounding phone call from the other side of the United States, as far away as you can get from Florida to Washington State. And somebody called me out of the blue and said, you know, I understand you have a, a website that you're not using or a domain name. Right, domain. Would you be willing to sell it? And I said, I might. You know, would you want to make me an offer? And they made me an offer, which was exactly the amount of money I needed. So, you know what? God is good. Yes, he is. He is faithful. So, so when you're having these conversations, there's no reason to panic. There's no reason. And we're going we're gonna to study that prayer mm. that is called the Our Father, right? We're going to study and look at that because that is a calming prayer to bring us to a place where we can rest in the Lord. I'll show you, all right? So from individual prayer, and remember, Jesus often went off on his own, and I, I talked about that last week and showed you many instances in Scripture where he would go off by himself to pray. Mm -hmm. But then the corporate prayer is about when we gather to pray, because there's power in prayer when we come together and yes. pray, where two of you agree touching anything, right? Mm -hmm. But as I was praying about that one morning, last week or the week before I was praying about that, and something just struck me like a ton of bricks. I'm looking for power in our prayers. You know, don't you want to have, sometimes you pray and it's like it doesn't feel like it's getting past the ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. When we pray, we want to see power in our prayers. Well, here's what came to me. And let me give you a disclaimer to start with. I am not a nuclear physicist. You may have noticed that. And I'm not a scientist. You may have noticed that too. However, I am a very prayerful considerer. Is that a word? Considerer. An observer of God's creation. Yes. Now, that's particularly important to me because I came to salvation. I came to that relationship with God. Because God spoke to me. Now, remember, I, I had grown up in a traditional religion. And uh, I, for, for 33 years, I was part of that religion, but had no real personal relationship with the Lord whatsoever. And no personal relationship with the Lord seemed to be important to me. But I would go out and look at the stars. And in my pride, I mean, because I we were pretty successful, I would look at those stars and I would feel crushed because as big as I felt when I looked at what I had and what that guy had or that guy had, I'd look at the stars and I would just feel totally insignificant. So one day, it was my birthday, I was sitting at my kitchen table and Alice had brought a Bible into the house because she had gone and gotten saved about a month earlier, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I flipped that Bible. I went over. It was, the Bible was sitting on the refrigerator, and I was having coffee. And I went over, I grabbed the Bible, and I came down. I set it down. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know. And I just flipped it open. Mm -hmm. And I flipped it open to what David wrote in Psalm 8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou take to him? And I heard a voice. It was audible. It may have only been inside of me, but it was audible. And it was the voice of the Lord. And he said to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. And I sat there and I began to cry. I mean, it was. So I learned something that day. I mean, I, I came to that place where I surrendered my life to the Lord. And for the first time I had life. Mm. I mean, he gave me life that day. <clears throat> Although he did say to me, you've had your life and now it's mine. All right. But it was because of the moon and the stars. It was because I considered the moon and the stars. Just an aside. I know this is an aside. But many, many, many years later, I mean, I've been doing this. That was over 41 years ago. I was in a church and I was preaching and I shared that as part of my testimony. And I said that I, w I was humbled by the moon and the stars. <laughs> and I heard that same still small voice. And you said to me, you're wrong. Now, I don't know if any of you out there are pastors or preachers or teachers, have you ever had that experience where you're in the midst, standing before a congregation, and 
sharing the word of God. And all of a sudden you hear God tell you you're wrong. So I said to the congregation, excuse me a minute. <laughs> and I turned my back and I said, you know, I said, Lord, wh what? And he said, it was never the moon and stars that humbled you. He said, it was my glory that humbled you. Yes. You see, for the heavens declare the glory of God. That's what it says in Psalm 19, right? We need to consider the work of his hands. And I don't think we do that. And how often Jesus said that. Look at the Sermon on the Mount. Consider the lilies. Mm -hmm. Con consider the birds. I mean, look at God's creation. Why would we do that? Because it is written. Go look at Romans chapter 1, where it says God reveals his attributes, his divine nature, his power through what he has created. Mm -hmm. We can come to a greater understanding by seeing what he has created. Well, what was the first thing he created? He said, let there be light. And there was light. Spoke it into existence. As he does everything. God speaks it, it's in existence. So that led me to this that morning, a few a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was that I was praying. And I, I, then I said, I'm not a scientist, but I started thinking about atomic power, right? And it just came to me. I know very little about it, but I knew this, that there's a difference. You know, there's two kinds of nuclear action. Mm -hmm. there's, there's fission, is that right? And there is fusion. Fission is what bombs are, uh, you know, atomic bombs are, are made out of. That's what was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were fission bombs. And fission is where they split an atom and incredible power is released. But fusion is far, far, far more powerful. And fusion is when they collide atoms and they come together and become something new, right? They, they unite. Mm -hmm. And that just struck me because it's all about division and unity mm -hmm. to understand when it comes to prayer and power, when it comes to anything spiritually in power. The Word of God says clearly, let there be no division among you. Doesn't it? Yes. That's yes. a command, not a suggestion, mm -hmm. not an encouragement. It is a command of God. So I was thinking, well, there's such power in our prayer when we come together. Right. That's fusion, right? But you could never do that were it not for the fission. fission. Yeah. And fusion bombs are typically set off. It takes a fission bomb to set off the nuclear bomb, the fusion, uh, fusion bomb, right? Mm -hmm. A hydrogen bomb. It takes that much power just to set off the fusion bomb. Well, the great fission event that starts the fusion was... This is, uh, it's hard to conceive of this. Mm -hmm. The foremost command is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is That's one. Right. And I believe, because it says it, that the Father and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are one. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. But for one split moment in time, just split Second in time, there was fission. When Jesus Christ, who never sinned, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for our sake. And it was sin that was nailed to the cross. And Christ cried out in anguish, My God, my God, why hast thou have forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. For that one split second in time, Jesus was separated from the Father. That was the fission. But that was the fission that set off the fusion. And we were made one with the Father. Right? That's the power of God. There is such disunity in the body of Christ. Such incredible, in spite of the command of God. There is such disunity in the body of Christ 
and we wonder why our prayers lack power? God wants us to have that atomic power in our prayers. But it takes, first of all, you're, you have no prayer life if you are not united with Jesus Christ. Because ultimately our prayers have to go to the Father. That's what he taught in that in the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, pray this way, our Father. But you can't have him as a father unless you have gone to Jesus and been united with Jesus. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father but through me. So it took that incredible, powerful event for us to be able to come together in unity with Jesus, come together in unity with our Father, and then have unity with one another. If you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't have a right relationship with God, I promise you, you will never have a right relationship with any human being. You want to know why so many, so many things are failing in people's lives? It's because of a lack of unity. They are not of the same mind. Right. They're not of the same mind. They're not in agreement. A house divided will fall. And, and it it's says. like, you know, how can two walk together unless they're in agreement? Unless you're of the same mind, well, you're not going to have that power that comes with that unity. Right. It won't be there. How can we pray together? How can we come together? If two, two or more of you agree, we have to be in agreement. That, I mean, that's a, an obvious statement. But it takes that power. When we are truly in agreement, and I believe that in these perilous last days, we are going to see not great church growth, not, not good anyhow, mm. because it's going to be a great apostasy, a greater falling away. And there's going to be churches like the Church of Laodicea that grow and grow and grow and they're boasting and how wonderful they are. And yet they are, Christ is absent. That's what it, in Revelation yes. chapter 3. This church, the church later this year, they're boasting. They say, we're rich. We have need of nothing. And yet Jesus Christ is outside. He's not even in there. No, I'm talking about a, a true unity of fellowship of believers. And, you know, you can have that unity of fellowship. You don't need a lot of people. Right. You know, Mark said, what, what Jesus said, two or more, okay. uh, two or three of you gathered in my name. There I am in your midst. And that power will be there. That power of, of, of an atomic explosion of fusion. Mm will be there because nothing is impossible with God. Absolutely. Absolutely nothing is impossible with God. You know why? It's Jesus said, it says in the gospel, if you believe that, you could say move mountains and those mountains would move. That's not an exaggeration. No. We don't have unity. We need that atomic power in our prayers and that will only come when we are driven it was that fusion explosion that drove things together. We need to pray that Jesus would drive us together in perfect unity. And I'm going to tell you something. It may not be a pleasant experience in the natural. Well, it wasn't for Jesus. It was not. All right. We, we have to know the Father. We ha you can't know the Father unless you know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you have to know how to pray. So the disciples came to Jesus, and that's what they said. Teach us how to pray. So what we have then in the Sermon on the Mount is the model for prayer. What we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, which is inaccurate, by the way. Yeah. It's not his prayer. His prayer was, not my will, but thy will be done. All right. So we're going to pray in this way. It's a model. Pray in this way. So I'm going to read now from Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13. And we're going to, then we're going to study it, right? Pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's in our prayer, right? Yes. Let me just read that that I've mentioned here, because it says in Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything, they may ask, it shall be done for them by my father who is in heaven. I'm telling you, I, I can't. Peter talks about it. He talks about if a, if a husband is not being right with his wife, treating her properly. That's going to stifle his prayers. Why? Because there's not there's not that unity between them, mm -hmm. right? We have to learn to pray 
effective prayers. You know, it says in James that the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much, right? How do you know if you're in agreement with Jesus? Because you, if you're not in agreement with the, with the Lord, your prayers won't go any higher off the earth than this. He won't hear them. So, well, how do I know that? Everything is in the word. All of the instruction for our, right? First John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If he hears us, it's done. But we have to be praying as Jesus did, not my will, but thy will. You have to know what God's will is. How do you know what God's will is? Well, it's in his word, but that's him speaking to you. God, this, this word, I mean, there's a difference between, a, I'm going to be real prayerful about how I say this. There's a difference between the scriptures and the word. Yeah. Now, before you go run off, think about this. Yeah, don't, the, don't holler the, heresy. Don't holler heresy quite yet. The Pharisees <clears throat> knew scripture backwards and forwards. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And yet they didn't recognize the word when he walked in their midst. Mm -hmm. You can know scripture, you can quote scripture without knowing Jesus Christ, who is the word. So we know what his will is because of his, when we hear his voice in the word. And because we listen to God, we listen to him. When do you listen to him? That's what prayer is. Like I said, prayer is not me going before the Lord and saying, here's what I want. I want this, 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 and this. Prayer is me going having a conversation with the Lord. And it is more important. Think about this. What you hear is more important than what you say. Right. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Faith doesn't come by you coming and going to the Lord and saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. Faith comes by you hearing his voice. Right? Right. So prayer has to have as a focus hearing from God. Right? You know, I, I, this is probably not a good example either. When I was a little kid, if, if, I, if I were a little kid, I actually was once. Okay. You know, I go to my, my mother and it's half an hour before dinner. And I say, oh, I want ice cream. 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 I could actually go on for Laura. You know what? It's, it's, it wouldn't be her will. And if she loves me, she's not going to give it to me. Right. So when she says, no, dinner's almost ready. Now I know what her will is, right? So if I say, well, will you give me dinner in heaven? Oh, I, you know what? I'm praying according to we, we To have that power-filled prayer life, we need to know the will of God, and we need to be praying the will of God. Because we know if we pray in his will, we'll it's have it. Right, okay. So, you know, Paul says, test yourself, examine yourself. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, right? Are you praying God's will or are you praying your will? They should be the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right, so let's start by this prayer. It's about conversations with our Father. Mm -hmm. That's what prayer is, conversations with our Father. Right. So the very first thing to note, and perhaps the single most important fact in our understanding of prayer, that it's based on our relationship with God the Father which is made, only made possible Through Jesus. by the atoning work of Jesus. Yeah. John 14, 6 again, right? So, and I, I mentioned, you know, when I was first saved, which was an event that changed me totally, completely, absolutely. Mm. It made me different, hallelujah. It, new creation. And made me new, right? That's right. People that I knew, and at the time I, I owned a business, they were... It, it made a big difference in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changed me. So they were all saying to me, what happened? What happened? You know, w what are you? What's going on here? And that was back in the mid-70s. So there was a time, there, there was a revival going mm -hmm. on. And the term, you know, uh, charismatic, charismatic was being bandied about very, very much. And so I, I, I knew what had happened to me. What had happened to me was Jesus. Then the other question was, what are you? You know, are you one of those Pentecostals? Are you a charismatic this or a, and that I wasn't sure of. I mean, I honestly didn't know. And I'm talking about immediately after getting saved. So and but I recognized that that was something very, very significant. So I went and prayed. 
And I started asking, Lord, what, what, what is this? What, what's the correct answer to this? What am I? Am I a Pentecostal? Am I a charismatic? Am I a born again Christian? Am I a... And the answer was very simple because he led it to me in his word. Mm -hmm. The spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Sons of God. That's the only thing. He's, I'm going to tell you something. He will not bear witness to the fact that you're a Baptist. A church of God, a assemblies of God, or any, any denomination. You know, the yeah. spirit of God will bear witness to the fact that you're a child of God. That's why we have the power, it says in that same chapter of Romans 8, to cry out, Abba, Father. To call him Father. When you can call, when you can go before Almighty God and literally know that you have the right to call him Father, it changes everything in that relationship, all right? It's not like you're going to your boss and begging him for something. No. All right? All of a sudden, it's this, this personal relationship with somebody you know loves you, right? So, Yahweh, he is our father. Jesus is our high priest, our brother, and our bridegroom. So it says in Hebrews 4.16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can go to the throne. Of, you want nothing? Let's say when Moses went up the mountain, he said, don't anybody else, don't even touch that mountain. Mm -hmm. You'd die. The presence of God is that awesome. But us, the children of God, we can go running into his arms. It reminds me of Jack Kennedy, John Fitzgerald John, John. Kennedy, when he was president of these United States. And, the, the, he, you know, the Oval Office, the office of the president is a hallowed ground, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And nobody just goes in there on the, except for his son, John John. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be having a press conference. He'd be having a meeting. Here comes this little kid, shoom, running in, and he'd throw himself and grab his father's leg. <laughs> well, that's the right that you have. I mean, you know, yeah, it'll train you at appropriate times. But the fact is, we have that kind of relationship that we can run into the arms of our father. The King James says, let us come boldly before the throne. That's our Abba Father. It's to Abba Father. Daddy. So, if your attitude is wrong about your prayer, if you think you have to go convince God to give you what is good, you know, you don't have to convince God to give you what's good. He's already proved. This is, this is what Paul knew. He said, if God has given his only begotten son, if that's what he's given to purchase us, what other good, what good thing is he going to withhold? We don't have to convince God in prayer to be good to us. We don't have to convince God to give us what we need. He's already promised. He said, my God shall supply all of your needs, our needs, through his riches and glory. Our prayer, our prayer life, I mean, stop and think, what, what are you praying for? And then how are you praying for it? Because if you're going to your father... It changes everything. Well, this will probably take about 14 years for me to get through. <laughs> the Lord but you know what? that before you get through. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then I'll have this conversation okay. face to face. Amen. But please, please consider what I'm saying. Consider the fact that you need to examine yourself and see what your prayer life is all about. Is it a conversation with a loving father? Even if it goes through your loving brother? Or is it like you're going to a king and you're afraid to say anything? Be back again next week and we'll talk more about that in Jesus' name. God bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus.